My name is Nina Chinko, and I'm a Vice President at Catalyst Opportunity Funds, um, which is an impact-oriented real estate investment platform uh, that invests in the ground-up development of affordable and workforce affordable housing. And I'm going to be moderating the panel today. Um, I'm thrilled to be at SOCAP. It's been a really exciting week. Um, it's hard to believe this is the last content session at SOCAP. Um, it's been busy, so we, we very much so appreciate you all being here with us. Um, and I think I can very you know, confidently and boldly say that this panel will not disappoint. Um, a lot of time and thought went into um, selecting um, you know, the most innovative, thoughtful, um, knowledgeable, seasoned experts in housing. Um, and so I'm delighted to have these three on the stage with me today who are really hand-selected to talk about, about their work in this space. We're going to be talking about one of the, the great crises of our time, which is the housing affordability crisis in the U.S. Um, we have hit a true inflection point. For the first time in U.S. history, uh, about half, so 49% of all U.S. rental households are cost burdened which means that they spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. And of that number, about half, um, so 20 million households, spend more than 50% of their annual household income on housing. Um, so a, a crisis of this scale, a crisis so acute and widespread, requires, it requires innovation, it requires cross-sector collaboration, thought leadership, um, certainly some grit. And um, today we're going to be hearing from leaders in healthcare, leaders in banking, leaders in the um, real estate space on how they're partnering and innovating um, to expand the affordable and essential worker housing stock and also provide wraparound services to um, address a, a broader set of social determinants through the locus of housing. So I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce the panelists and then we'll, we'll dive in with the discussion. Um, so on my left here, I have Andy McMahon, um, who is the Vice President of Impact Investment with the Health Equity Group at United Health Group. Um, in his role, Andy works very closely with the United Health Group Treasury team on their tax credit and social impact investment portfolios, and specifically on expanding and diversifying the ways in which um, they invest to support and strengthen communities across the U.S. and to um, improve community health outcomes. Uh, Andy's tax credit investment work includes a 200 million health and housing fund that invests in affordable housing and services. Um, prior to joining United Healthcare, Andy worked for the Corporation for Supportive Housing for 15 years, and there he led an array of, of national and state and local efforts to align systems and integrate resources to create um, housing opportunities for vulnerable populations. Prior to that, Andy held positions in both the state and local government. He was a lobbyist for state housing and community development in DC, and he also helped to found and was the first um, executive director of a nonprofit housing organization in Minnesota. So welcome, Andy. Thank you. Um, next to Andy, I have Celia Smoot, who has over 20 years of experience in affordable housing, um, with specific uh, expertise in financing and in regulatory compliance. She's currently the Senior Vice President at KeyBank, heading up um, LIHTC, so Low Income Housing Tax Credit, Multifund Investing, um, Affordable Housing Preservation Investments, and also SBIC Investments. Prior to KeyBank, Celia served as a, a Vice President at the National Affordable Housing Trust, where she um, developed funds focused on supporting BIPOC developers, um, and also provided technical support for um, nonprofit organizations and um, housing authorities. She also served as a director of LISC Housing and managed a, a national team there that set housing strategies and, um, and policy, as well as structured and um, raised capital for and managed housing funds. And she's also an attorney. So prior to joining LISC, she was an attorney with HUD um, and several other private national law firms that focused on affordable housing. Um, so last but certainly not least is Jeremy Keel. Um, Jeremy is an incredible leader, innovator, and um, practitioner in the impact investing space, and specifically within the impact-oriented real estate investment space. He's the co-founder and managing partner of Catalyst Opportunity Funds, um, which is a real estate impact investment firm with about a billion dollars of um, real estate across the U.S., and Catalyst specifically invests in affordable and workforce affordable housing. 
Um, Jeremy's also a co-founder and um, partner at the Sorensen Impact Group, um, which is an institutional impact asset management and advisory platform. Um, and prior to founding Catalyst and the Sorensen Impact Group, he was the president and CEO of the Sorensen Impact Center, um, which is a, a university-based think tank um, that focused on social impact and innovation. Um, prior to that, he was a senior advisor to the mayor of his hometown of Salt Lake and also spent 10 years as a corporate lawyer. Um, so I wanted to start by setting the stage a bit on the housing affordability crisis um, we're experiencing in the U.S. and then dive into a little bit of what, what each of you do more specifically. So Jeremy, I'm wondering if I can actually start with you. Um, you founded Catalyst five years ago. You founded it specifically to address what you saw as an escalating housing affordability crisis. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the crisis looked like then, um, how it's changed and what it looks like today, and then what Catalyst's role is in addressing that crisis. Yeah, thank, thanks, Nina. Thanks for, uh, for everybody being here. It's great to be with you. <clears throat> I thought when you were introducing us and you said, you know, we did this very thoughtful approach to the panel to get national experts and leaders and practitioners, I thought you were going to say, but those guys were busy, so we got, <laughs> so we asked these three folks to come instead. Um, <clears throat> but no, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and, um, you know, in particular, to be with these other panelists, uh, you know, Andy and Celia and Nina, who are good friends and colleagues. Um, so Nina stole my favorite stat on the affordability crisis. I, everybody's talking about the affordability crisis. Um, I think it's helpful to actually put some data behind it. And, um, and I think Nina's got, you know, really the headline stat that should keep everybody up at night a little bit. Um, which is that basically half of the you know, households in this country are uh, spending more than 30% of their income on rent, which is kind of the HUD threshold for um, you know, cost burden, basically. And when you get to that level of cost burden, um, it, you're effectively, and it's hard for some of the folks in this room, you know, probably me included, to kind of put yourself in this context, but when you're making um, those kinds of decisions with how you're gonna allocate your discretionary income, um, it means you're making trade-offs with other uh, parts of your, your life and, and other kind of opportunities that become foreclosed to you because you're just so all in on your rent or your mortgage payment or whatever it is. Um, half, I think Nina also mentioned, half of those folks that are cost burdened are severely cost burdened, meaning they're spending at least 50% of their incomes on you know, rents or mortgages. And, and there, even more so, you just have so much less to, to go around to cover other kind of, you know, key items in your life, transportation, you know, education, uh, you know, food, grocery, those kinds of things. So, so I think real impacts for real people, when you think about the magnitude of the problem, there, there's an estimated five and a half million unit shortfall um, in this country in terms of getting to kind of a healthy housing market. Where, uh, where folks that need housing have access to the housing. And that's a big number, obviously. Um, the problem with that number is that there's no sort of silver bullet. There's, no, uh, there's nothing sort of in sight that is helping to kind of you know, reduce that number. That, that number is only getting bigger and bigger over time. Part of that is because there's effectively a market failure in, in real estate development right now, which is that as construction costs have gotten very high um, in the last few years, as interest rates have gotten very high in the last year, 18 months or so, um, effectively the only projects, if they pencil at all, uh, but the only projects to pencil you know, in this day and age are effectively luxury kind of you know, high-end uh, units for the very you know, kind of class A segment of the market. Um, so much so that Harvard's Joint Center on Housing Studies estimates that about one of every 10 new units that's getting built in this country is going to that demographic that Nina talked about, you know, super low income, uh, deeply affordable, and or kind of workforce affordable. The other nine, nine out of 10 units that are being built in the country are going to that kind of luxury um, end of the market. So. Five and a half million unit shortfall, you know, getting bigger effectively every year. Um, part of what I think probably has to happen at some level, and I'm sure we'll get into this, you know, where I see market failure, I think about, you know, government stepping in and trying to solve this problem. 
Uh, at the federal level, you have the Light Tech program, which um, you know Celia and, and Andy spend a lot of time in and are um, you know are experts in. That's a great program. The problem with the Light Tech program is it's a finite allocation of tax credits every year, and so there's a lot of new units that we can be thankful for that are sort of uh, you know financed and sourced through the Light Tech program. But it's it's not enough, and it's also not doing anything for that kind of missing middle demographic, the folks with. Um, you know, the folks with jobs, but who can increasingly no longer afford to live in their own communities. You know, bank tellers, cops, nurses, teachers, you know, kind of the, the uh, you know, sort of the proverbial backbone of the workforce in, in these communities. Um, the last thing I'll say, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, at least from my perspective, is that, you know, to Nina's point, when we started out with Catalyst five years ago, the affordability crisis felt very acute in the coastal markets, places like San Francisco, New York. Um, places that we were focused on, you know, Salt Lake City, Nashville, you know, Minneapolis, kind of some of the secondary markets, it didn't really feel that way. Those places still felt fairly affordable, and there were not a lot of, uh, there were not a lot of warning signs, I guess, in those markets. So it still felt like kind of mainly a coastal problem. In the last five years, that has completely you know, changed. And every community that we're in, doesn't matter kind of where it is in the country, how big it is, the number one uh, sort of complaint from, you know, local elected officials, you know, local communities, et cetera, is just like, we can't afford to live and work in, in these communities anymore. So I, I think the affordability crisis has now, you know, kind of run the table and gone across the whole country. And I don't see any good sort of policy solutions at the federal level. Some states are stepping up in different ways, kind of innovating in ways that they can, local governments as well. But there's no real silver, silver bullet on the, on the kind of horizon to solve the problem. Do you want to share just a little bit about Catalyst and what, what Catalyst does to address this crisis? Yeah, so we, we have, uh, you know, I guess sort of in our own way, trying to nibble away at that five and a half million unit um, sort of deficit. We're focused on ground-up development, and uh, ground-up development of mainly kind of workforce attainable and also deeply affordable housing units in the country. Typically, that's part of a mixed income uh, structure where you might have a mix of, again, deeply affordable, workforce affordable, and maybe even kind of market rate units, all part of the same um, kind of community, which we think is a best practice in, in urban development. Um, we are not developers, we partner with developers, so we're kind of LP capital partners to developers. And what we've done, I think, pretty effectively over the years is gone out and found a network of, you know, sort of best-in-class, community-driven developers who are local to their, uh, to their communities. These, these are low-income communities, they tend to skew communities of color, and the developer sponsors that we're working with as partners um, are also largely BIPOC and or women-led development firms, which we think is really uh, pretty cool and, and, and differentiated. Uh, those folks are building projects with the full support of their community. It's a very different, you know, flavor of development than what you, uh, you know, what you might find in other contexts in these kinds of communities. And so it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of bolt onto those folks and, and provide, uh, you know, equity capital to, to fund their pipeline. Uh, because it's really kind of a grassroots, uh, you know, support type structure that they're that they're working with. They've done a lot of civic engagement, a lot of outreach to the community, uh, and so we become their equity partners. We're now on our you know second, third, and fourth deal in some cases with uh, a lot of those same sponsors. Um, so that's what we do. We we have a very kind of robust impact reporting and measurement framework, which I think I'll get a chance to talk about in just a minute. Um, but yeah, really putting kind of impact and community at the core of, of what we do. Thanks, Jeremy. So, Celia, I'd love to come to you next. You've been in housing for a long time. Um, I started when I was a baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, if you have anything to add about how the housing crisis has evolved over the course of your career, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Um, and I'd also love to hear a little bit more about your specific work at KeyBank mm -hmm. um, and what role banks play in addressing the housing affor affordability crisis. So, I, I will say that for myself, um, I, I've my first job out of law school was at HUD. So I have been a houser my entire career, um, even though I work mostly in the finance part, legal and finance part of, uh, of this industry, I've always considered myself a houser. 
And I think that's a really important differentiation as most folks kind of work in the industry. You know, there's a lot of talk about yields and leverage and all these terms, but I think that the difference is if you, if you embrace the idea of being a houser, you realize that you need to do all those things, you need to talk about all those things, but the idea, the goal is, is to create and preserve the housing. And if you approach it from that perspective, I think that that is a real differential than how you actually care and think about the eventual family that's going to benefit from the work that you're doing. It's important. And so I would say in terms of the affordable housing, so there's a couple of things I always like to say. We have a crisis. We, we know that we have to do something. I, I think about the, the every deal or every fund I've worked on since my career started, I remember starting my career working on Hope 6 projects. I closed Hope 6 projects for HUD. I was in Philadelphia working with the Philadelphia Housing Authority. And I remember the... My, the, remember going out to the site and understanding like why we needed like why we needed to change how we addressed public housing, how we needed uh, capital to address public housing, and it also made me realize that this idea of a federal solution. It just wasn't going to happen, even with how much you know dollars were being appropriated for Hope Six. The 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 times when you know the government wrote really really big checks for housing to build that housing to 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 support that housing, it's just it's, it just didn't exist anymore. And I really have a hard time seeing how that's going to change anytime soon. So we as housers, we as industry professionals had to start thinking smarter about how we leverage all the different resources to actually get to a place where we can build and preserve this housing. And it, and it was very clear that it wasn't going to that we weren't going to be able to just rely on a public resource. We needed to rely and work with and leverage private resources. And you even had to be more flexible and you had to be more creative even doing that. So through my career, I can think about all the like random, like harebrained ideas I've come up with with my team and finding ways to like address certain housing affordability. And like, when, like in our first kind of conversation we would have about this, it really may have sounded crazy, but in turn, it turned out to be some of the best ideas we ever came up with. Um, so I one idea I just, just, just we're talking a lot about multifamily housing, but I always distinctly remember being in the room with um, uh, a group of people, including the mayor of Detroit, and you know, you would think that in a city like Detroit, housing affordability wouldn't be an issue, but it is, right? Uh, you would think that in a city that has such a decline in population, you know how do you have housing scarcity? You have housing scarcity even in a city that has population decline. And, and they had, you know, there was all this like, you know, re, re, uh, how do you address vacant properties and all that? And that was great. Those are great discussions. We need to figure out how to address that. But one of the things that the mayor said, and I, I will, will always remember this, he was like, well, what do we do with the people who are still here? How do we address housing and like the state of the housing for the families that are still here? And so the idea is like, what do we need to do? What do we need to create so that we can help families repair their homes in a market where there is no value, right? Home repair loans all come from like some idea that there's equity in homes. That didn't exist in Detroit. So we created, we literally created a program, we created a debt instrument that will allow people with zero equity to finance home repairs. Um, and to me, every time we were faced with some incredible problem to address some issue of housing, some issue of affordability, I realized that the, the thing that made the difference was approaching it from the, home, from the sense of being a houser, but also approaching it from the sense like, you have to think differently, right, on how you actually achieve these things. Um, another example I have is um, Denver. So the city of Denver, they had all this high market rate housing that was built, but all the people who worked in downtown Denver couldn't afford to live in all that high rate market housing. Um, and the, 
the mayor at the time and the city council was like, we had to figure out some way to address it. And you had resources for families that were, you know, that were um, 60 and 30% AMI and below. Obviously we need more resources for those families, but like that missing middle was a huge issue. And mm. like 70% of the service staff, nurses, techs, and all the hospital systems couldn't afford to live downtown. And they were literally driving 30, 40, 50 minutes just to come into work. And so like, yeah. how do you address it? So, oh, well, it, is there a way that we can actually fund with leveraging private and city resources to come up with a local voucher program? Yeah. I spent six months trying to design and figure out how do you do a local voucher? <laughs> like, and so I uh, talk about the dynamics of affordable housing and how we as an industry address that. I always say that no matter what, we will come up with a program to address it. <laughs> Remember mm -hmm. the time when we didn't have a bond market? We created a, a program to buy, <laughs> to buy bonds, even mm -hmm. though there was no bond market. Um, so I, I say that to say that the creativity is definitely yeah. one of the trademarks, I think, of our industry. And yeah. those of us who've been doing this for a very long time, you just you had to Embedded. be creative in yeah. order to be successful in order to get anything done and yeah. and what do you just to for the audience what do you do yes. right now at key bank can you say that in your own words yeah so i um so what i um uh, in typical fashion of corporate america i have a title but i have four jobs <laughs> i uh so i technically run um our um uh, our fund investment strategy. So anything that has a fund sponsor, um, that where we can, where we as an investor can put money into a fund, equity capital into a fund, and that supports a series of lower tier deals on our housing side, uh, but also supports on our um, on our SBIC side, which are small business investment uh, corporations that want to support small businesses, we basically place that money in there. So I have a team that I work with. One person from my team on the housing side is here, Chris McKenzie. And so that's technically what I do. The other things that I do, I lead our entire impact strategy for our entire platform. Um, mainly it's because it's like when you start asking questions of like why we do this, why this partner versus that partner, you know, could we do better here? Um, I think like it's one of those things where you ask too many questions. It was like, you know, those are good questions. Why don't you figure that out? Uh, <laughs> and so then it became <laughs> my job to figure that out and figure out ways that we can do better. Um, and I think the third part of what we do um, I think a lot of this is about trying to be as comprehensive and holistic as a, as basically a bank. We, at the end of the day, we're still a bank, but we're a bank that really cares about community. You know, we're mm -hmm. based in Cleveland. You know, our footprint kind of hugs Canada, except for Dakotas and Minnesota. <laughs> um, and we also have Alaska. Uh, so, like, we, we, we are in a lot of, basically, communities, and a lot of the Rust Belt communities, or, or I think they're called legacy cities now, legacy city communities. Um, and so there's no way to, you know, we care about those communities. And unless we have a comprehensive, holistic uh, vision about how we address that, we need to think about more. And we need to be able to do more within the confines of just rules and capital mm -hmm. constraints of being a bank. So we mm -hmm. even launched a syndications platform so we can work with our developers and work with larger kind of community and comprehensive responses to to housing and there's a way for us to kind of bring in and work with other investors uh, that may have appetite and also has to th think like we do think yeah. about community think about yeah. impact so that's the uh, other job <laughs> thank you Celia. um andy i'd many love to hats. Yes. many hats yes andy i'd love to come to you next um so you work for united health group I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the social determinants of health um, and you know, specifically the role the built environment and housing in particular plays in health and health outcomes. And then you know, what your role at UHG is and, and why is UHG kind of investing in the social determinants? Sure, thanks so much, and is this on? Okay, great. Um, so, and thank you all. Great to be here uh, with such a great uh, group of people. So, really appreciate it. So, I think uh, one thing to know at the outset, right, is that we're not a bank or a financial intermediary. We're a healthcare organization, right? And so, I think uh, from our perspective, you know, having a safe, decent, affordable place to live is essential to being healthy, 
right? So that's kind of the, the cornerstone for us is to understand the enormous impacts that the built environment, including a safe, decent, affordable place to live, has on not only individuals' health, but also community health, right? As we think about ways as we're doing redevelopment or other things or how that fits into a broader kind of community strategy, which I think we'll, we'll talk about um, in, in a little bit. But so I think, you know, from our perspective, we are, and I'll talk about our fund in a little bit, but but we're really focused on not only uh, helping to expand the, the supply or the stock of affordable housing uh, in the country, but also thinking about ways in which we can, at the community level and at the project level integrate housing and healthcare and integrate those systems and think about how can affordable housing developers or public housing agencies work with federally qualified health centers that are probably a stone's throw away, right? And there's just, right, it's the classic, we've all been, I'm old, we've been talking about silos for three or four decades now, I think, but um, but it's true, right? And so thinking about um, how we do that, and, and I would also just say, you know, from, we also, you know, all of that is just kind of entirely just community focused for the entire community. Um, you know, in particular, you know, we serve 7 million people on Medicaid, a lot of whom have housing challenges, and so, you know, for our members, we also provide housing navigation services and supports to ensure that that they are getting the safe, decent, affordable housing uh, that they deserve. Um, and so, my role really at uh, United Health Group is to uh, partner with our Treasury team. I see my dear colleague and friend, Mr. <laughs> Stephen Henry, uh, in the audience there, um, uh, who's with the uh, just amazing Treasury team that we have there. You know, and we're really focused, I think, in, in partnership with Stephen and his team and others on figuring out, um, you know, again, how we uh, expand our investments in affordable housing. And I think importantly to what um, I think both of you have mentioned is, you know, we certainly will talk about kind of our investments in, in the LIHTC space, but also thinking about ways that we use equity or concessionary debt or other tools and thinking about how we can support affordable housing investments. And then also thinking about where there might be opportunities to create workforce housing that is outside of the LIHTC space where you have in, you know, to some of the folks Jeremy's may be talking about where, you know, you can, you know, we think there's the potential at least for thinking about how you could build workforce housing outside of the tax credit system so that you would be creating additive units. I think, Jeremy, you said it perfectly, right? I mean, LIHTC is great. We're, we're substantial investors in it, and it's finite. LIHTC's going to deliver what LIHTC's going to deliver. And so we're, we're a, a robust partner in that, but we're also trying to find these other ways of financing affordable housing because we know how great the need is, and, and we need to be finding ways to add those additive marginal units in, in communities across the country. Amazing. Thank you, Andy. And when you're thinking about workforce housing, I'm curious, just off, off the top of my head, you know, are you thinking about um, UHG employees as well? So it, it could be. I mean, it would, it would, again, as we think about that, it would, it would not be kind of dedicated for. But we certainly have lots of folks that, we serve that, are, that are nurse practitioners or community health workers or a whole host of folks. So I think, you know, like a lot of, you know, pretty, as every single investment we make through this is what uh, in healthcare ease we call plan agnostic, which means it's open to everybody, <laughs> for those who aren't in healthcare. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we would certainly view that in the same way, you know, but if the opportunities are and, and, and some of the people who work in United Health Group benefit, I think that's, you know, all the better. So I want to segue to talk a little bit about community, and it's already come up a couple of different times in this conversation. Um, so really the best, most effective, most authentic real estate and housing strategies hold community at the center. Um, they're done in collaboration with the community, not to the community by an outside group. Um, so as institutional investment shops, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about your approach to doing that. Um, Jeremy, I'm wondering if I go back to you, I'm curious about how you keep community at the center of what you do. Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, I'm glad you asked the question because I think this is, you know, part of the secret sauce for, you know, being successful um, in a strategy like this because, uh, you know, we're, we're local. I mean, my firm is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. We're local to Salt Lake City, Utah. I can't pretend to be local to these other communities, and yet we're investing nationally. I can't pretend to be local to these other communities. And so um, I think the beauty of the work that we do is we do it through partnerships with people that are local to their communities. And I think that um, that's sort of a key a key point. Um, we, we have a few um, sort of tactics, I would say, to kind of help ensure that we are, as Nina said, keeping, you know, community first. One is that we, um, we actually have a, a, a very robust, what we call community needs assessment that we, um, 
that we do on every um, kind of sub-market that we're proposing to invest in. So every, neighbor, every neighborhood that we're looking at a project in will actually do a very comprehensive you know, data-driven needs assessment that looks at something like 25 different kind of publicly available data sets that go down to the census tract level, to the very kind of neighborhood level. And that gives us a snapshot in time of what's happening in that community from a you know, socioeconomic pers perspective, um, you know, level of educational attainment, you know, you know, affordability issues in the housing market, um, et cetera. And that then informs a very, I think, robust conversation that we have with our developer partners about what sort of programming ought to go into the real estate that, that they're building in that community. Um, again, not that we pretend to know or have the answers, but in a very data-driven way, it at least sort of sparks a conversation with the developer. And that um, kind of iterative you know, conversation that we've had with developer partners, with the local community, you know, local mayor's offices, et cetera, have led to, for example, in food deserts, you know, co-op grocery stores going into the ground level of our buildings where you have affordable units, you know, affordable housing upstairs and a co-op grocer on the, on the ground floor, right? That's a great way to both address the affordability crisis in that community, but then also bridge the gap to, um, you know, services and amenities that that community really, really needs. Um, in other instances, we put in, you know, workforce training facilities, you know, again, on the ground floor, you know, community credit unions that are then providing financial literacy programming, you know, homeownership 101 programming, things like that. Um, you know, healthcare, obviously, you know, Andy's spoken very articulately about the social determinants. We also have a, you know, number of instances where we've actually brought in healthcare clinics, so preventative healthcare services to a low-income community you know, below the, below the housing units themselves that are, you know, providing kind of preventative healthcare services to that community. So that, that's all informed by and driven by the uh, community needs assessment that we do. The other thing that we have is we have something called an impact scorecard, which we, uh, which we sort of, you know, do on the front end of every investment that we make, where we look at the project we're being asked to invest in and then sort of score it from an impact perspective as to how well it's addressing the needs that have been identified in that community. And one of the big kind of categories on our scorecard is what is the civic engagement process that this developer has been through to get the support of the community? And, um, and we score that, I think, in a very objective way. And uh, that's a big sort of driver of, the, of, of kind of the underwriting for that project. Um, the other thing that we try to do, and I think a, a thoughtful way, is, is think about the wraparound services. So these are investments in the built environment, but what does the service environment look like that kind of wraps the real estate? And, uh, you know, we've got some great examples of nonprofits that we partnered with, um, you know, alongside the real estate to provide services to our tenants, but also to the broader community. Um, we're toying around with an idea currently to bring in kind of clinically trained community health care workers into our building that are providing kind of service navigation um, functions for the tenants in the building, but again also more externally facing helping the broader community get access to services, things like that. So always thinking about, you know, how does the built environment become the locus for, um, you know, thoughtful community programming um, into that neighborhood. Yeah, so a very holistic approach, not just housing, but really thinking about how to um, kind of plug service uh, gaps and amenities in these communities through, through your buildings. Um, Celia, KeyBank is focused on community development. Um, can you talk about what that means and why it's so important to KeyBank, and also how you're thinking about um, the communities that you serve um, in addition, outside of housing, or kind of in addition to housing? So, as I said before, like our we have this kind of odd, we call it Canada footprint, but at the same time, we also realize that we, a lot of our partnerships that we've built over time, um, a lot of the developer partnerships, uh, organization, um, like CDFIs and stuff like that, community development financial institutions are, just so you know, everybody knows our industry has a lot of acronyms, so. <laughs> so you, someone could be the acronym police if we say one and be like, what is that, what is that? Um, so we built all these partnerships, um, and a lot of that is the reason being we built these diverse partnerships so we can have the most diverse and holistic, comprehensive response to the communities that we're in, right? 
Um, we, you know, our group is really community development, financial, you know, investing in lending, and that is a large part we do. A large part of our um, investment in lending activity is really focused in on housing, but we are fully cognizant that housing can't be the only thing that we address, and we really want to have a robust uh, response to the community. We work very closely with our corporate responsibility team to make sure that the nonprofit organizations within the communities that we're, we are are financing or investing in that built environment actually have the resources so they can provide the services, the community outreach, and all those other things that make, and that, that basically help to address, and my, I think a real quick and easy way to think about it, how are the things we're doing making people's lives better? Right? We can finance and invest in the housing, but what are the other things that we need to do so that people have healthy, healthy, happy families? Um, and so like, a lot of that is thinking about what are the other partnerships, what are the other things that we can support. Like I mentioned before that we do small business investments. So we do investments into funds that basically address small businesses. And I've had several, even internally, like, okay, so why do, you know, why, why do we put this with this group that pretty much focuses in on housing? And our response is really, really easy. We are doing comprehensive response to communities. And mm -hmm. I always just say that you know, housing is where biz small business goes to sleep. You know, most of those, you know, there's been so many studies done, like everybody, <laughs> like small, if you invest I in small that. businesses, those are the people who are hiring the families that live in the housing, that live in those communities. That's, you know, that is their hiring and their job base. So if you want to address all things in communities, you've got to address small business, you've got to address um, the housing, and then we also, uh, you know, I won't get into the tax part of it, but there's some funky stuff with new market tax credits that doesn't make it great um, for all banks to invest in it. Um, but we still do it, even though it's not, you know, it's not the best for us from uh, from an accounting and tax perspective. Mainly because, like, the new markets are addressing community infrastructure. You know, we've invested in funds that address charter schools. Um, Cleveland um, doesn't have the best school system. Um, and um, we want to address ability for education for the families that we're, you know, that for the housing that we're investing in. We also have to invest in charter schools. We have to invest in every aspect of a built environment that also provides a comprehensive response to the families so that everybody has an opportunity to be happy. Yeah. Thank you, Celia. Yeah. Um, Andy, I'm curious about how you use the social determinants of health framework, which is a broad framework and mandate, um, and apply it down at the local level, at the community level. Um, and if, in your experience, are there you know, markers of successful strategies that are perhaps both scalable, but also you know, deeply community-oriented and rooted? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. When, it, when I saw we were gonna, there was a specific question about community, I was like, I was invited to the right panel. <laughs> Be, because what, what I would say, you know, even as a large kind of sprawling organization, what I will tell you is that from, from where we sit on, on our team, you know, genuine, real, authentic listening and community engagement isn't a good thing to do, it's an unequivocally necessary thing to do to be successful kind of hard stop, right? It's not like, oh, it'd be good if we did that, but if we don't, well, you know, if that doesn't work, we'll just go ahead and do it anyway, right? That, that no, that's, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, I mean, it has in the past, but that doesn't, you don't maximize impact for the communities you're trying to serve unless you're authentically and fully and comprehensively uh, engaging with them. And so I think, you know, from from our perspective, one, that's just a, a core tenant to what we do, and I'll, and I'll give you two examples in, in, in a moment. But, um, you know, I think from, to your, to your point about kind of the how do you be authentic to the community but also scale, right? I, I, I think of kind of the old 80-20 principle, right? Where there's some things, and it's probably more like 60-40 or something, but where everything doesn't have to be completely bespoke, right? There are things like every community is different, undoubtedly, and so you need to adapt your, your approach to that community and the people in that community. But communities also share a lot of things in common. So you don't, you don't have to recreate the wheel 100%, right? And so that's, I think, the approach we take. And it's a balancing yeah. act of saying, how can we not literally start from scratch every time you walk into some place? Because that's not necessary or efficient. But also, how do we ensure that we are tailoring 
what we're investing in and the engagements we're doing um, to each of those communities. So that's kind of how we uh, try to thread that needle. And, and I think, you know, two quick examples I would give you is that Great. we um, were delighted uh, several months ago to uh, announce a investment in Impact Appalachia. Uh, so we are uh, partnering uh, with uh, our friends uh, Invest Appalachia, deeply rooted in the communities of Appalachia. We're focused on the 25 poorest communities of Appalachia, uh, primarily in West Virginia, Kentucky, Eastern Ohio, Western Virginia, and North Eastern Tennessee. I think I got my geography mostly <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, but there, the, the, the key there is that, and so I, I've been there a few times to, you know, go and meet with people, and, and our treasury team has been there as well, but, right, we rely on our partners there, right? We, I don't know that, I didn't know that they had the ability to or the need to create this amazing farm that also had a workforce component that then also they were, they were, um, you know, growing fresh fruits and vegetables and then selling them to the county school board so that the kids could have healthy meals, Right, and, and, and we made what I would say is a very small, it was probably a total of $200,000 that went into a refrigerated warehouse and, and refrigerated trucks to do the disbursement and so they could scale their own operation, right? Andy McMahon sitting in west part of Minneapolis had no clue, right? But we have the right trusted partners on the community that knew that we're in Beckley, West Virginia, and this is what we need to be doing. Uh, so I think that is is really critical to, to how we um, do our work. And then the other thing I would mention is that we partner a lot with our um, colleagues and friends within uh, community and state at United Healthcare, which is uh, our Medicaid organization. And, you know, and in more than a couple of different uh, communities where we are going in and very authentically going in and creating these community-based collaborations with housing authorities, with federally qualified health centers, with local nonprofits, and very intentionally with, you know, multiple principles, but I think the two that are most near and dear to me are shared decision making and what we're going to be doing and co-creation of intervention, right? That, that is not how a lot of people roll, right? A lot of people say, well, I saw this, I know this, we're going to do that. And this is, this is the wicket that I use, and so we're going to use this wicket to do that, mm -hmm. right? That happens a lot. And so we are, we are unequivocally flipping that on its head and saying, no, we're going to listen to the community, engage with the community, then we're going to share decision making and decide what we're going to do and then we're going to share how we're going to do it so those are just a couple of examples of how from our perspective even as even as a large organization we feel like we are able to be rooted in and keeping community at the center those are fantastic those are great examples did you did you have something no no um, not in my head that's good not in your head okay that's, that's yeah and, so, and i'm <laughs> yeah i'm <laughs> and i think you're so right each community is different it has unique needs um but also the kind of markers of what makes a community healthy and, and robust and, and thriving is the same. And so do you have a, a framework that you use? Are you developing a framework that has some flexibility for kind of more nuanced? Yeah, so we are um, definitely looking at that. And, and a lot of it, so we have some kind of core markers that we are looking at in terms of kind of economic vitality, housing affordability, access to food, access to transportation. And then within each of the, especially with the catalyst, uh, it depends. Then we also figure uh, markers based on that intervention, right? So if we're focused on maternal health, excuse me, what are the things we're going to be able to look at? So that's a good example where we have these kind of overarching kind of markers that we can look at, you know, that are these social determinants around food, housing, transportation, et cetera. But then, then having that, but then layering on top of that, what is it and how can we think about the markers and the measurements of the particular intervention, right? Because you're going to be thinking about and, and thinking about the impact that a maternal health program has, you know, on, on you know, pre, you know, early childhood or, or early birth. Um, you know, it's very different than folks who want to focus on childhood asthma and how do we reduce that, that so much of it's rooted in, in old housing stock, right, is the, is the short answer there. And so we kind of add that component to each of our cattle. So that's the kind of component that's kind of tailored to that community mm. with our other broader rubric. That's fantastic. Um, and one last follow-up, I'm sorry to pick on you continually, but so there are, I think, five social determinants of health and then sub-bullets within each of them. How are you thinking about prioritizing the social determinants? Are you thinking about the right balance or 
so focused on some of more so than others? That's a great question. I mean, I think, I think we try to think about where we can have the greatest impact, right? And so I would say if you think about right through our affordable housing investments, we can help on the affordable housing side. I would say on the food security side, I think we, do, we, we, can, we can do there. And I think on the transportation, we can do some, right? And I think, you know, Lawrence, you know, like in, in a couple of communities where we're trying to think about, okay, how do we think about that? And, and certainly from a housing perspective, right, we try to think about can we invest in housing that's kind of near, you know, transit-oriented mm -hmm. developments and, and those sorts of things. But so I think, right, because they're all so important, you know, I think we'd try not to kind of leave anyone off or kind of pick a favorite child, but rather think about in this community, where are we best positioned to impact, you know, the one or two the most? Yeah, that's fantastic. So um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, this isn't necessarily the easiest time to be investing in housing. <laughs> um, interest rates are high, con construction costs are high, you know, high inflation, um, and doing work right now requires a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation, um, a lot of you know, partnership, as you guys have talked about already, um, innovative financing structures and strategies. Um, earlier this month, Jared Bernstein, who's the chair of the US Council for Economic Advisors said, and you said this earlier, Jeremy, he said flat out in a press conference that affordable housing does not pencil, and that there's a market failure, and essentially that government needs to step in. Um, so Jeremy, you know, as a firm investing in ground up affordable and workforce affordable housing, how do you make it all pencil in this environment and how have you had to get creative? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I, you know, there's a doom and gloom story here, which is that nothing pencils and, you know, the affordability crisis is getting worse. Celia made a really good point, which is like if you're, you know, waiting for the federal government to step in and solve this, like, don't hold your breath. Um, so there's that doom and gloom, you know, version of this. The, the counter, you know, the flip side of that coin is that, um, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And, and because this has become such a crisis, because there, you know, there's no sort of forthcoming, you know, magic silver bullet from the federal government, what you find in these local communities is a lot of innovation. Um, and that's on the financial side, that's on the, you know, kind of development side, you know, the bricks and sticks side of, of, this, of this work. Um, and so, you know, again, it's not perfect. It's not going to solve the problem, you know, writ large. But there is some, I think, you know, really promising innovation that's happening in, in some of these communities. And part of what we try to do at Catalyst is, frankly, you know, invest in that innovation and then try to lift it up. Last year we had, or the last couple of years, we've had panels where we bring our developers at SOCAP and other conferences and get them to talk about the work that they're doing, that, you know, the ways they've solved for problems like the ones we're talking about in their communities. Because what we find very often, not surprisingly, to Andy's point about silos, is that these folks work effectively in their communities, but they're not really talking to other folks in other communities doing similar work. So that sort of transmission of best practices isn't really happening. So we, we try to find ways to kind of bring those folks together to get them to kind of tell their, um, tell their story. I'll tell you just three really quick examples from our portfolio. We just invested in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, with an African-American developer there who has built a relationship with the Southern Baptist Church. Um, and it turns out that a lot of these churches in the South have big surface parking lots and other land holdings around their churches where, uh, you know, and, and, and that land isn't really doing anything for anybody at this point. Um, but the, the churches are willing to kind of put those parcels into a redevelopment effort that creates workforce housing, affordable housing, other economic activity, other services for the community, and these churches are actually becoming part of the cap stack, right? They're contributing the land at a discounted, you know, heavily discounted basis, and, and then sort of riding into the deal. That little bit of subsidy in the land basis is actually really catalytic. That, that helps make that kind of redevelopment possible. So we, we just invested in one of these projects in Winston-Salem. We're looking at a programmatic partnership with this developer group in other um, sort of similar contexts throughout the Southeast. That's one example. There's another example of a, a developer in the Pacific Northwest, on the other side of the country, who has figured out a way to work very closely with government on parcels that the government has effectively uh, land banked. These are kind of urban infill parcels that the local RDA of the city has control of, um, can't really make sense of. She's able to go in, she has a very plain vanilla development 
program format where she stamps out the same building um, you know, every time, and she's done like 50 of these throughout the Pacific Northwest. It's not like you know, sexy architecture necessarily, but there's a level of efficiency to what she's doing to where the rents can be at a price that's affordable for that community. So there's, there's some innovation kind of in the bricks and sticks and, and design side of things. Um, the last example is a, a partner of ours in, in Minneapolis where, where Andy is, who has gotten very good at sort of working with city, count, county, and state in Minnesota to get grants to support the work that he does. So tax increment financing, tax rebates, you know, government grants, et cetera. And there's some innovation in the capital stack there that allows him to deliver um, sort of new product in communities that otherwise, you know, th these kinds of investments don't pencil in. So again, limited examples, but there are some sort of, you know, you know, light, you know, points of hope or lights that um, that we look to at Catalyst, and and we're interested in sort of finding those, investing in those, and then lifting those up uh, nationally. So real kind of innovation in the project level capital stocks, which I think has been core to the firm since its founding. Um, the second fund that Catalyst um, launched has a, an innovative fund structure that's also um, quite unique. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you for reminding me. I meant to talk about that as well. So that, so everything I just described is kind of down to the project level. At the fund level where Catalyst sits, um, we also recognize, you know, kind of an opportunity to do something that was innovative. So we created effectively a two-tranche structure where we have a market rate oriented kind of tranche B for investors that are looking for that, that need that. Um, and then also created kind of a tranche B for less yield sensitive, kind of more impact focused investors for whom a three to 400 basis point discount on the financial return is acceptable in exchange for sort of guaranteed impact or affordability in the portfolio. And there's a number of those folks, including this lovely woman, um, at, you know, to my right. And it turns out that sort of the net effect of blending the, the tranche A and the tranche B capital together results in a lower cost of capital to the projects that we're investing in, such that we can take a project that really only pencils at all of the units at effectively market rate rents and bring that down to something that's more like 60 to even 100% of the units below 80% of the area median income, which is sort of the sweet spot for CRA, you know, healthcare, some of the other, you know, kind of constituents that we, that we work with. So, you know, again, not going to solve the affordability crisis writ large, but we think it's innovative and, and it's certainly um, impactful in the communities that we're investing in. And I'm curious, just, um, you know, what has been the reception to this two-tron structure? Um, has it really resonated with, with people, investors? Yeah, I, th I think there are a variety of investors who have, you know, for a variety of reasons, regulatory, you know, CSR, you know, whatever it is, they have a mandate um, and a mission around, you know, sort of addressing this crisis. And so those are folks that um, are actually very happy to be in this kind of tranche. That doesn't mean that there's not a lot of also kind of market rate oriented investors that would also like to be in these projects if that works, you know, f f for their perspective. And so it, it's being able to kind of, uh, you know, sort of tailor the capital to the different audiences that we're targeting. And again, it doesn't take a lot of that kind of tranche B capital, that slightly concessionary capital to blend down kind of the aggregate cost to these, to these projects um, in a way that's really, really impactful and, and allows us to get these, um, you know, these affordable units in place. So it, I think it's been really well received in the market. And uh, again, just another example of kind of the innovation that's, that's happening out there. So um, Andy and Celia, um, you both are allocators that have been in this space for a long time. And I think both of you have already touched on some innovation that you've, you've been a part of. Um, have you had to get more creative in recent years as the kind of housing crisis has mounted and it's, um, it's gotten harder to, to make projects, affordable housing projects pencil? What are some you know, unique strategies either you're seeing out in the market or that you're kind of leading yourself? So I will say, um, one, I know we were thinking about doom and gloom, but I just was reminding people I have a lot of, you know, really bright uh, millennials 
on my team and you know talking about seven percent interest rates i was like okay when i was a 27 year old lawyer i was handed a whole stack of deals that were called FAF deals and there were all these deals that were done in the 80s and they were being refinanced and i remember the first time i looked at a deal that had a 14 percent interest rate we lived through that we'll live through this yeah. <laughs> My, my brother's first home, he paid 18 and a half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, oh, sorry. There's a question? Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, sure. You know, there will be time for questions at the end, but if okay. it's, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, he was like, did I say something that sparked something? <laughs> um, so I just I do, I do always want to say that like we will we, we live through that we will live through this. Uh, the other thing I say I mentioned it earlier like we are the most resilient industry I think of any industry. If there is something that becomes a huge obstacle, don't worry about it. We'll design a program to work around it. Um, I think our industry is so much. Um, so I've been working with and talking to a bunch of Australians that are also trying to address their affordable housing issues in Australia. And um, one of the reasons why that they, they 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 will grab you know some of those experts and will they'll bring us over to Australia to speak to all of their housing folks. And the reason why they spend so much time looking at the U.S. system because even if you look at every country in the world, and even though we have a housing crisis, even though we have you know things that we have to address, just the resiliency and the innovation and creativity of our of our industry and of how we are address affordable housing is literally other countries that are now starting to really figure it out. They have to come up with different solutions to address their affordable housing issue. They are mimicking some of their new programs um, off of our programs. So I think that there's something to be said about that. So I want everyone to realize like we will we, we will make it through. <laughs> we, we always do. Um, but I would say in terms of uh, creativity, like you, know, you think about like like I am a you know I'm, I'm I work at a bank so like how creative can banks be, but you'd be very surprised that, like if you have the right people in the room and the right intentions, how creative you can be. Um, one of the things that we consistently think about and one of the things that we consistently do is that we look at like what is the best way to kind of do that that that. The delivery, right? If it's not, how do how are we financing all the parts and pieces of the project? Not only addressing, you know, okay, construction costs. You know, we've had I've literally had conversations. It just happened. My husband's also a HUD attorney, so he's downstairs. And I'll be sometimes having a conversation upstairs. <laughs> I can hear him downstairs, and then we're talking about what can we do to get like our early start. I know this seems like a simple solution, right? But when you're working in the Midwest and you're closing in November and you want to get started in the way that will help you address your construction timeline and you want to get started immediately before the frost starts, like just a simple little thing there, you know, address some of the cost factors that we that we were looking at in the lower tier deal, and we realized that you know we were going to have to get HUD um, on board with that. And so the question is, you know, not only we were willing to look at that as a solution and creativity, but also you know taking the, the, the role of also helping to engage the other financing partners so that we all could come to agreement in a way that will help find a solution for our project. That's a small, small example, but like those small examples, you know, multiply by a hundred. It's really how you think about ways to be creative and just timing, right? Um, I also think about uh, one of the things that we are doing is this private partnership, right? Private public partnerships. We are not only do we invest in housing, not only do we invest with you know great sponsors like the Catalyst Fund, but we also invest in creating like local funds. So we're working with the city of Cleveland. We work with the city of Cleveland, and then we brought in a, a financial intermediary like LISC, and together we came up with a strategy to fund a Cleveland housing fund. And what that's going to do is address like the early start money for a lot of developers, like where that cost of capital is prohibitive to them to do all the things they need to do early enough to even get the project in the pipeline for credits or for other type of equity financing, non like equity financing. Um, how do we make sure that we're providing the, the, 
the support to think about how you plan for the other amenities around that housing and where are the ways that something like a housing fund could address those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that those are, all of that is important, right? So it's not us funding a specific deal. This is us funding a mechanism to address several deals. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Leah. Andy, I'm curious for your thoughts no, as well. Those are great. I mean, I think, so I, I would mention a, a couple of things uh, from my perspective, but I'm really glad you mentioned that kind of like construction start before frost. Like your eyes may or may not glaze over, but it's a really important thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I just think to your yeah. point, right? I mean, I think there's, right, I fully agree on kind of right the, the private public partnerships and expanding those. I think you're spot on though. I mean, and there are lots of, I'm not gonna go through every one today, but there are lots of examples like the one you just mentioned, Celia, around that can create, aren't gonna create, you know, 30% efficiencies in our delivery system, but there are efficiencies that we can create. And, so, and, and the kind of time value of money when you get delayed by lots of things. So I think there are um, a number of things that honestly the, the industry itself needs to look at and thinking about, again, at least to my knowledge, there's nothing revolutionary where we're gonna be like, oh, we didn't realize we could save 30%, if only we did, like that's highly unlikely. That said, I do think there are lots of things out there where we can think about um, the efficiency. Uh, I do think we need to be focused on that. Um, you know, as Jeremy and, and, and you have both pointed out, Nina, kind of, kind of about the overall need, right? It's like, you may only have a, a you know, small efficiency here, but to your point, if you do that efficiency, 5,000 times, it actually matters. You would actually, if you could execute on that efficiency at scale, you could actually cre create, you know, a, a measurable number of more units of affordable housing. So I think the kind of, you know, I think there's always a constant clamor for like, we need more public investment, we need private, more private investment. That's all true. I also think there are efficiencies uh, to be had, you know, and, and I mentioned earlier, right, that we're a healthcare organization. And so, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, as we think about innovation is where we can focus on the integration of health and housing, right? And so now in, in 2020, we launched a $100 million health and housing fund. Um, we added another 100 million in 2022, so it's now a $200 million health and housing fund. You know, and I think um, from our perspective, the, the three things that, that you know, we like to think our differentiators of that fund are, one is that we're only investing uh, essentially in, pri in projects that have that health and housing integration. It could look like a lot of different things. It could be supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. It could be affordable senior housing with a care coordinator. It could be affordable housing with a, you know, with an MOU with a federally qualified health center uh, where they could do that work. Um, so that's one component. Uh, the second is that we, uh, as United Health Group, provide kind of seed financing for for services uh, to each of the projects that we finance, right? It's there's no silver bullet. You know, we're not providing you know 10-year funding for something, but we are providing kind of catalytic funding to to help them start. And then the last thing that we're doing is. Um, working with our partners uh, to actually re uh, measure resident health and wellness outcomes over four years. So we're asking questions about access to primary care. We're asking questions about food insecurity. Uh, out of COVID actually now, um, we have a, a question now around social isolation, um, which I will just do a 10 second commercial on. If you haven't checked it out, Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General has written a book and there's all sorts of studies out there now about the ridiculously horrible impacts that social isolation has on our primary health, our mental health, our entire lives. Um, so those are kind of, you know, I think the efficiencies, but then, you know, again, as a healthcare organization, we're trying to think about how can we innovate within the affordable housing developments to also then create those connections and bridges to the healthcare system. Great. I know we're coming up on our time and I wanna maybe ask you guys one last question and then we'll go to the audience and so maybe just a sentence or two and Andy, you just touched on it and Jeremy, it's certainly come up for you a number of times but you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about your unique um, and very meaningful solutions to the affordable housing crisis but if we kind of zoom out and look at the scale of this crisis, I'm curious just quickly from each of you, what is it gonna take to actually solve this problem in the US? I'll have to go first and I'll be very brief. I mean, I, I think I think one of the things, and, and I'll just say as a managed care organization, right, we have to 
have enormous amounts of money on our balance sheet in order to make investments. So does every other managed care organization and lots of other large institutions have ways that they're investing. And I think one of the things that we need to do is try to get more of that kind of capital uh, focused on, on affordable housing and, and, and educating people about the facts. I think, I know I've talked to lots of people and I've been asked to talk to a lot of people who think it's like a risky investment. And it's like, well, no, not if you have the right partners and you underwrite it, it's, it's really not. Less than a 0 .004 loss rate in affordable housing. There's nothing more secure, <laughs> maybe than a government bond. Yeah. Um, Today. Yeah. So my answer is going to be real quick, money. We need more money. <laughs> we just need more money. We need smart money. We need money, non-greedy money. We need money. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I. I come back to market failure, you know, there's a reason that the private sector doesn't build roads and freeways and train lines in this country. It doesn't pencil for the private sector to do that. I think there has to be more public involvement. You know, the LIHTC program is necessary, not sufficient. It doesn't address the missing middle. I think government just has to be at the table. And, and again, states are dealing with this in some form or fashion. In, in isolated pockets. The state of uh, Minnesota just passed a billion dollar appropriation uh, for affordable housing, which to my knowledge is the biggest investment by any state um, per capita basis or otherwise into affordable housing. The state of Utah where I'm from just passed a $25 million appropriation, which is just not anywhere near enough. So, you know, states like Minnesota may be you know, sort of the leading edge of, of uh, places that are going to kind of get, uh, you know, get a grip on this. But I just think government has to be, um, you know, more at the table. And, and we need more private sector investment as well. I think it takes both. So, yeah, I would love to open it, open it up for questions. Um, yeah, and you had a question, burning question. <laughs> Houston, one of the most auto-driven cities in the world, and we're creating a corridor, and it's, it's a very community-driven project with some historic buildings, but we're taking these sites that would have been front litter townhome sites and creating what y'all would consider missing middle-income housing, a thousand units on smaller sites. Where we're stuck is parking code, and we have not found one financial institution in America that will segregate the economics of parking from unit mix, and, and we're, we've done a few small projects, and it's unbelievable the supply demand misalignment in this country of especially young people that want to rely on micromobility, transit, car share. We have, we're testing electric car share as infrastructure. And even the city of Houston, which is like, you know, not known for being progressive under our current leadership, gave us market based parking. So, like, they've said no parking is needed, but every bank is still saying 1.4 parks per unit. And that's $35,000 a park. That's like over $300 a month amortized on somebody's rent check for market-based work. So like, if there is one bank that will give us a loan, we have two projects that will pencil, at like 12, 12 to $13 rent checks, dignified courtyard style housing, sub 100 units clustered through the neighborhood. We can prove this model, but there's not a bank in America that does that and from the health and the health impact is amazing because the people that live in the neighborhood are working and owning businesses in the neighborhood. Eighty-four percent of our businesses in our first project live within walking distance to their shop. So when you when you give them this condition, it creates unbelievable ben benefit. So I'm curious if you have looked at in a post-World War II auto obsessed city like Houston, any projects like that. I will say that I will never forget the. To, I don't know, people, a lot who people who've been doing this for a long time, there's this program called 202, which is a program done by HUD for old people. I mean, that's basically what it is. Well, thank you for just right? Yeah, it's right? Great. It's a program done for old people. <laughs> and I remember like like looking at these deals and like especially in cities like New York, and the program still required parking. And we're like, this makes no sense. One, it's New York, no one has a car. Two, grandma's not driving. Like, it's just, it, it, it makes no sense. And it took years for everyone to kind of, kind of, I call, come to Jesus. And now they're allowing all of those old 202 projects to now build new housing on those parking lots they, that they made them have. Because they sat there empty, there was no cars there, and they were actually, you know, useless. In, 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 in like, in a city as dense as New York, that parking was useful. I, I always think that like that like those lessons learned, right? Eventually, like 
people get it, right? So, you know, one of the things I always have a hard time, like we have projects where like that discussion comes up and it's usually some construction guy and plan cost and review and they tell us because those people are not actually the finance or the housing people. They're just, they have, they're for very specific, um, they're for, you know, expertise in that particular area. I think that what it does help and what it does require is, is like the, the folks who are actually working on the deal, they're called the, the deal team, really being able to have a discussion to say like, in this case, even though our requirement may be why, in this case, we can have a deviation from that because it makes sense to have that deviation. And we've, you know, I would say that I've worked on so many deals in my, I've only been at KeyBank for two years and I literally have seen four or five deals where we're like, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, we need a deviation from this requirement. Um, so I do think that it takes like having the right people in the room, especially having your deal people in the room, because um, I'm guessing it's probably some credit, some credit plan cost requirements sitting there. It just takes the deal people on the front end deal people to actually have that conversation and be able to show like in this case the deviation makes sense. I will say that mm -hmm. a lot of local governments have already crossed the Rubicon on this mm -hmm. and have not, you know, have, have relaxed those requirements or done away with them altogether. The, the city has already done that. So, so banks are saying parking, the government is saying no parking. Right. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Yeah. So I work at a CDC in Philadelphia. <laughs> So part of the challenge that we're seeing with uh, the capital stack is that it only pencil out to a 60 or 80% AMI mm -hmm. that doesn't represent the black or the Latino population that need the housing. So we're seeing a lot of the affordability going into that population that at the end is ending up displacing full communities um, in, in the urban centers. My question is, have you seen any crea creative capital stack that take the project below that 60% AMI? Um, because at this point, we have land to develop. Um, light tech is too slow. <laughs> light techs have the problem that no, is way too slow. slow. You have to wait five years to close it. So how can we deploy um, a, this type of social impact investment to get to that that threshold below 60% AMI. So we, we, we would have lots of discussions, and I think everybody can answer this. Is we go like for deeper income targeting, right? How do you address building housing that gets to much deeper incomes? You know, like you know, the different levels, like 30, 40, 50 percent AMI. And yes, LIHTC does take time. Um, anything that government's involved is always going to take time. Uh, and then you'll, you'll, and you'll see that a lot of the advocates and a lot of folks who are working in the industry have done a lot, have done some good work in requiring that some of that housing that is being built and funded by LIHTC does get to deeper income targeting because they build it out. Like I always say that funding rules reflect policy. So like a lot of those Q QAPs now qualify allocation plans. <laughs> nope. Um, uh, I'm yesterday, right? Are, um, are requiring now some deeper income targeting as part of their rules, like part of their scoring. You're more likely to get funded if you're getting to deeper income targeting. But that's only getting to a little bit of it. I mean, there are definitely, most of the rental subsidy programs are designed to address that, you know, deeper income targeting. The problem is that we don't have enough of it, right? So we need to be able to figure out ways, to, how do we expand that housing? I will also say that one of the things that we did um, when I worked um, on a particular kind of like local housing fund, you know, in combination with the local housing authority, the city and the foundation in Charlotte. And um, the, the, the housing authority was also part at the table. And one of the things that we did, we built into this financing mechanism, like you can get this financing mechanism and we'll find a way to work with the housing authority so that there's an idea of having um, um, rental subsidy, but you can't take the highest rental subsidy. In other words, if you develop or wanted access to the subsidy, the idea that you know technically this rental subsidy would pay you know market right or a certain part of FMR, so up to 120 FMR, depending on if you were a small FMR. I'm getting too huddy, but I'll stop. But basically, but like basically, if you're a developer, you can get like you can get a market rate rent. 
a market rate rent, even if you're housing at 30% AMI, right? That's the reason why a lot of developers want this voucher. But we were like, well, that only means that, say that for just simple math, it only like gives us ability to have 10 in this portfolio. But if every developer, remember, we are providing some concessionary financing as part of this deal. Every developer, you take rent at 50% AMI. You'll take rents at 50% AMI. This voucher will fund you at 50% AMI, but you're housing a 30% AMI tenant. So that way we were able to take those 10 vouchers and then make them 20. So it's like things like that. If you know, work, think about it like really creatively of all the partners at the table, ways to do that. And I think that a combination of the concessionary financing, combination of having the housing authority, the foundation and the city at the table was what, our ability to change that dynamic. Can, can I add on to that? So yeah. on the non litex side, um, and I don't know how it works in Philly. We don't have any projects in Philly, although Celia is based there, so it's a good know. resource there locally. <laughs> Um, but in some of our other markets, the local government that's putting in a tax increment financing, you know, commitment or a tax abatement or, or a grant, um, the smart local governments will condition that money on an affordability set aside that's typically sub 60% AMI, and it's typically in deed, so restricted in deed. So getting to kind of LIHTC, um, you know, affordability levels. Uh, but it's just through a subsidy from the local government, so much easier to kind of uh, you know manage and administer than than LIHTC. Uh, but it but it would be like you know 10 to 20 percent of the units. It's not going to be the whole building because um, the building has to pencil kind of on market rate terms. But uh, but you do get that 10 to 20 percent of units set aside, 50 percent or below in perpetuity, indeed. So that that might be something to look at if if Philly doesn't have that. You know, you could advocate for it. We've noticed that cities and counties around the country are starting to kind of converge on that model. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yeah? Uh, oh, sorry. Completely different context. I'm from Mumbai, and we're working on slum redevelopment, and I could relate to all of the things that all three of you spoke, and it's exciting to see sort of health and housing and finance sort of come together. Um, I have a question, actually a couple of questions for Andy. Um, you talked about how you're measuring the health impact as it relates to housing. Uh, I'm just curious to know if you've translated that to economic indicators, because I'm relating it to climate finance, which is sort of avoided catastrophe. What we're seeing is when children grow up in homes that doesn't have enough sunlight, not, not, no, no natural ventilation, it does not matter what amazing after-school programs they go to run by other social service organizations, we see that they're lagging behind and sort of their opportunities and their aspirations going forward, what are the losses on that? So is that something that you have looked into? And if you have, I would totally love to steal all of that <laughs> calculation from you because we are a small social enterprise, so I've been looking for it. And the second part, I have another part to this, it's related. The community engagement piece, and I'm so glad you said that, that it's really about asking them the questions because I try to convince people and let them know that participatory doesn't mean coming up with the idea and then convincing the community to buy into it, right? You, come, you have to come together to come up with the ideas. But who funds that? Because somehow to expect a return on investment on that early stages of the project, I think is very unfair. <laughs> so we, we're kind of caught up in that because then is it the, is it the you know, pre-project development cost? But I see it even before being before that, right? Yeah. And it takes a lot of time and effort because at the end of the day, doesn't matter how many apps we have, how many tools we have, it's human to human connection. I go into meetings for 10 minutes, it becomes a lunch and then a chai for over three hours. So those are <laughs> so, the two things, sorry. So yeah. 100% agree, right? I mean, I think the amount of apps there and how overblown their ability to connect uh, is pretty remarkable to me. So I 100% agree with you. So to take the, the, the last one first, so, so through our um, Catalyst uh, initiative within United Healthcare, we actually do provide financing over each year over, the, over three years. Um, it's not a big amount of money, but it, it helps get people to the table because everyone's, right, everyone, you can't, like, you know, we all did sometimes like, oh, it's just show up. It's like, well, no, I've got 900 other things to do, and I don't, 
and I, my budget's busted, so I need, you know, and so, so we, we, what we have found, quite honestly, is that even if you provide a fairly modest grant, you know, I'm going to put it in the fifty to two hundred thousand dollar range in a community, you can actually achieve a lot and get a lot of engagement. It doesn't cost, a, you know, you don't need to spend a million dollars to do that, and so. So we have that's on a, and that's on that that's not on our Treasury investment side. That's on our United Healthcare side, just to be clear. But I think that's right, and it also demonstrates a level of of commitment to the to the community, right? And so it's it's not about the money, but the money doesn't hurt and helps. You know what I mean? It enables people to be able to to do that. Um, and then I think on your. Other question, I think uh, that'll probably be version 2.5 or something, quite honestly, about thinking about the economic impact. That said, I'd love, let's definitely follow up afterwards because what I would tell you, though, is that there's certain lot of, certainly a lot of evidence that suggests that people who are how, in stable housing, right, have more opportunities for work and, and, and gainful good employment. People who are healthy, right, the amount of, pe the cost of health care from an economic perspective in terms of lost wages and other things is enormous. So I think a number of the things that we are tracking are indicators of, but probably not exactly a proxy for. <laughs>